Welcome back and welcome to those who have just joined us for NATO Talk 2023. We will continue with our discussion. I am glad to welcome Werner Sonne here. And uh, we included the Hamas terrorist attack on Israel in our agenda. Minister Pistorius said in his speech he will never get the pictures of how the situation was described to him out of his head. So much horror. Ms. Riedel, thank you very much and welcome in the name of the German Atlantic Association and our partner, the Marshall Center in Garmisch-Partenkirchen. In October, I was in Tel Aviv. The sirens sounded two explosions. A military analyst from Israel, he told me this is not an exercise. This is war. And I thought history keeps repeating itself because one day before was the anniversary of the Yom Kippur War which I covered as a correspondent for the German uh, broadcast, television broadcasting company, ARD. So back then, Israel was caught by surprise. There were the attacks on the kibbutzim, hostages taken. It seemed like history repeated itself, and it seemed to me this is going to be not only a huge challenge, this is going to be a war, a challenge not only for Israel, but for all of us. So thinking of what happened over the last 48 hours, so the United States has become very active. Blinken is basically racing from one place to the next, trying to do his best to stop a conflagration and to stop this from spreading any further, because then we'd have two wars simultaneously right at our doorstep. We were able to include um, this topic in our afternoon discussion. We cannot go into much detail. For a month and three days, we've been confronted with this war, maybe our first ideas have changed a bit in the meantime, but how did it start? What was the situation like on October 7? I'm going to show you a video, or rather, rather Major Arya Shalikar, the spokesperson of the Israel Defense Forces, is going to show you this video. See this pickup truck which the Hamas terrorists used to cross into Israel, thousands of them heavily armed. They uh, took people hostage, carried them off. Let me show you around. What you see here, these are machine guns, Kalashnikov, all of them had been carrying Kalashnikovs, RPGs, ammunition, vests, motorbikes, three and four terrorists riding a motorbike. And what you see here, we have found hundreds of them in the area between Israel and the Gaza Strip, incendiary bombs, which the terrorists had thrown into apartments at the kibbutz. And these incendiary bombs made people burn alive at a temperature of 3,000 degrees. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, this was the introduction to our discussion. Major Shalikas, Major of the Reserve, now he had been the spokesperson of the Israel Defense Forces. He is back to this job. He has German roots, emigrated to Israel at the age of 21. Shalika This is a terrible and militarily a very dynamic process. Now, from your point of view, what is the current military situation in Gaza? Okay, first of all, we are active not only in the Gaza Strip, but also at our home front because Israel is under fire. Bombs come from Lebanon, also from Syria, even from Yemen. And there are certain areas on the West Bank, Jenny and Nablus. These are locations where the Hamas are provoking a war. It is a huge challenge. Of course, our efforts concentrate on the Gaza Strip, on Hamas and the Islami Jihad. And in the north of the Gaza Strip, we uh, have by now a strong presence. The Gaza City has been surrounded. It is the largest town in the Gaza Strip, and it's also the headquarters of the Hamas terrorist organization. So step by step, little pinpricks are what we are using to fight our way through to the center. 900,000 civilians have fled to the south into more secure regions, but there are still several thousands in the area, but also 241 kidnapped Israelis which were abducted and are now in the area. So we have to be very careful in our advance. Last night, we heard that the Israel Defense Forces have basically cut the Gaza Strip in half. Now, what does that mean? From the very beginning, we made it clear that we would concentrate on the north. That's where Gaza City is located, and also Bek Hanun and Jabalia and Ja'air. These are all strongholds of the terrorists, Jabalia, for instance, because this is a place that had appeared in the news. And in order to make any advances and draw the belt tight, so to say, around Gaza City, we have to take out these strongholds one after the other. Why have we cut the strip in half? Because the population was asked to leave the area and go south. There is the Al Mawasi area, Wadi Gaza, where people have access to food, water, medical care. It's an area where trucks with all sorts of aid deliveries arrived after being checked by the Israeli and Egyptian border forces. And we want to be very precise in our strikes against the terrorists. Now let's take a look at the other possible theaters at the front, such as the northern border. There have been skirmishes time and again, but we are talking about, as you put it, military pinpricks here. And Asrallah, chief of the Hezbollah, said 
I paraphrase. This was a Palestinian attack. This was not our doing. Okay, since October 7, Hezbollah is firing on us as well. One civilian was killed yesterday. Every day, provocations, bombs, and just like Hamas and the Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah is also basically the armed force of the mullahs in Iran. This is the place where the masterminds sit, where people, the mullahs, are pulling the strings. It seems at the moment that Hezbollah has to be, has to show solidarity with its brothers, but they do not wish to involve Hezbollah and the Lebanon into the war. Well, you have to take this with a pinch of salt. It's just the Arab Shiites are those that support the Palestinians, although they are Sunni. And what we witness today is that we are under daily fire, but of low intensity. And it is important we keep it like that. Otherwise, we might end up with this conflagration where we could never be able to carry out precise strikes. Not really good news, but nevertheless, a piece of news which gives us some time to take a deep breath. OK, Iran is behind that. But it seems that Iran does currently not want things to turn into a large-scale war. But it's difficult to say. You know, on 7th October, I would have given a different statement. Now, let's return to Hamas its military operation, its military potential and capability. I mean, it was planned like a large army's military procedure, which we underestimated. Also, we underestimated their brutality. We would never have thought that they'd burn children alive, you know, babies to abduct women and, OK, you can imagine what's going to happen to them. So from what I know now, combined with the experience I've made, well, we can always be caught by surprise. Because if Hezbollah and Iran change their minds, the situation will be quite different. OK, we need to re turn to the uh, discussion. Are you still able to hear us, Shalikar? OK, now let's turn to our panel here. To my left, we have Gita Honemann, member of the Bundestag since October 2002, a power woman of the CDU also as the federal chairwoman of the German Union of Small and Medium-Sized Businesses. But in this, in this capacity, she is here today. She is the deputy chairwoman of the German-Israeli parliamentary group. Next to her, Dr. Markus Keim, who has been leading the security policy research group of Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, who also advise the federal government. And, uh, 
And on the far right, a dear colleague of mine, Richard Schneider, who uh, was editor at large for the German TV RRD, reporting from Tel Aviv for a long time. So let us write, enter discussion about um, the situation. After 7th October, politicians have always used the term reason of state, raison d'etat. And you were a witness when Angela Merkel said Israel's, Israel's security is For us, a raison d'etat. There is, you know, one important thing because Angela Merkel in her speech before the Knesset said this raison d'etat might sound like just another term, but in times of crisis, it is the basis on which we show solidarity, which I do miss from the side of United Nations. I would have liked if um, Germany had been somewhat more outspoken. Now, who is going to take up responsibility within the European Union when uh, We are discussing the question whether Iran is going to be put on the list of terrorist organizations. Well, the regime. I think we have reached this moment, this turning point, the uh, Zeitenwende. It's now time to get rid of cliches and illusions. You know, the illusion being things will take their own course, something's going to happen, things will calm down even if we don't get involved. And whenever um, Israel felt threatened by bombs from Iran, well, it had sounded in our ears like the Israels are somewhat paranoid. Now we have this axis, Syria, Iran, Russia, and this is quite some potential here. And I'm very grateful that the US has taken up responsibility, shown solidarity, become active, but in how many conflicts can the U.S. get involved? Not only Ukraine and Israel, there's Taiwan, there's Nagorno-Karabakh. So solidarity is what counts today. The German Minister of Defense was with us this morning and he sided with Israel, no buts, no what ifs or whatever, and the Bundeswehr has deployed over a thousand troops to uh, the Near East. We've heard very little about that. So we are, uh, we have a parliamentary army after all, our armed forces. Whatever they do needs to be approved by Parliament. But we have also the UNIFIL mandate. There is a German uh, admiral in charge and a Corvette called Oldenburg is, has been deployed to the Eastern Mediterranean, you know, Cyprus. building a link also with uh, Jordan, preparing for a possible evacuation. In that case, the heads of the parliamentary factions would have to make a decision. We have to be able to react quickly, so sometimes Parliament as a whole agrees to the deployment of the armed forces only after the fact. Uh, 
Israel will uh, not ask for German troops to fight alongside the Israelis. This is not going to happen, and the ambassador tries to make us understand that at the very moment when the pictures of the massacres were shown in the media, we were shocked. But solidarity is a long-term thing. It needs to last for a long time, four weeks, six weeks. I need this solidarity from the side of the government. I mean, Boris Pistorius support, that's great. But if he says, I need more, then basically he hears from the government, OK, a pay rise is approved. Anything else is not. OK. German troops in Israel, Charlie Carr, is that an option? Is that something that Israel wants? No, definitely not. Over the 80 years under a threat of war, we have never asked for foreign troops, not from Germany, not from the US, not from anybody. No, it's a tour de force what the uh, Americans what the state secretary is uh, doing, has been doing. He is now visiting the region for the fourth time. Which are the most important goals that the US wishes to achieve? This is a very unusual development because not too long ago, the U.S. tried to uh, more or less stay out of any effort trying to achieve transformation in another country or region. The goal they were still pursuing in uh, Iraq. So. This was a failure, and as a consequence, the U.S. redefined its interests. Isolationism is not no longer on the uh, agenda, so it was all the more surprising how quickly and how forcefully the uh, U.S. has turned to the Near and Middle East, become involved. So this shows they cannot simply stay out, and they will not. So the US, as well as the uh, Europeans, had not started any political initiatives over the uh, last 10 years. This shuttle diplomacy under Clinton, which used to be the state secretary's daily work had been stopped for a while, but it's coming back. Now there was the narrative of a multipolar world, but now we have a unipolar world. It's all about the U.S., which has the leverage to exert an influence on the other actors, and this has become evident. Over the last few years, when Anthony Blinken went from one capital to the other, with a clear goal, right? The U.S. commitment means they will try to keep this conflict from spreading. Well, we talked about this conflagration that we don't want. The U.S. reacted by sending two aircraft carriers very quickly a strong signal, and then, and this has been become evident, the things that happen to the Palestinians, their destiny, it's not that the Americans wouldn't care, no. There is a consensus, and there are 
basically many Americans out there trying to draw attention to the fact that life needs to improve for the Palestinians. So there is, of course, this strong message, we will protect Israel, but there is a second thing we need to take care of the Palestinians and offer humanitarian aid. Now, this basic issue of the uh, reason of state, from your point of view, what does it have to include? What is this term supposed to mean today? Okay, let me put it like this. The discussion about the raison d'etat, that's a very German thing. The Israelis have other worries right now, you know. They turn to the U.S for help, and those are the players. The reason of state, that's kind of a difficult term when used by Germany, because whenever Germany acts, it needs to be together with the other EU members. So now the question comes up. How do you react diplomatically? And many in Israel did not understand the result of uh, the vote in the Security Council. So that sounded very, very strange to many Israelis. But as I said, the Israelis have other things to worry about right now. Like Arya just said, let me just put it like this. Whenever the German starts discussing raison d'etat, this is accompanied by the fear that Germany might be asked to send troops to Israel. But that's out of the question. That's not required. No one calls for that. And it's not doable because the Israeli way of fighting is very, very different from what the Bundeswehr would do. So it's much more important what will the Americans will be doing. And they have added something to the two aircraft carriers, a submarine of the Ohio class, which can actually fire nuclear missiles, has been deployed to the area, and this was made public. It was supposed to be a strong message. Going to Hezbollah, to Iran, we are here. We have a nuclear presence here, although it was not confirmed that the submarine is actually carrying nuclear warheads. It might be equipped with conventional ones only. We don't know. OK, the day of martyrs is coming up soon. Let's wait and see what speeches will be made. For Israel, it's important that the US shows a presence in the region that they are like a protective shield, even if the Hezbollah is to keep more or less out of the war, no matter what course it takes. That merely relocates the problem, because the problem jihadism, Hezbollah, Iran will persist. The Israelis might succeed in annihilating Hamas. It's another question, what will come after? Excuse me for interrupting you. OK, let me return to jihadism. Even if they succeeded in doing that, jihadism will still be around. So will be Iran with all its intentions, something the Europeans did not want to, wish to see, couldn't see. So Europe will have to confront this problem, not only verbally, but by showing action. So it's become evident that the US have 
started mentioning this two-state two solution again, reaffirmed by Biden, by Blinken. It's been around this idea for decades. After Oslo, nothing has changed. So is that a realistic outlook? No, a clear answer. It's not realistic because on the Palestinian side, there is no one who would have the authority, the power and the goodwill to actually negotiate this and then put it into action. Well, Hezbollah and Hamas, except for Abu Mazim, who doesn't get a lot of acceptance, are against this to begin with. He's 88 years old. Now, who is going to be uh, next? Will his successors fight each other? We don't know. And with this government in Israel, a two-state solution is out of the question. So many people assume that this government will go down after the end of this war. We will see. Many will demand that Netanyahu uh, would uh, stand down, but uh, a lot will depend on how the uh, war will uh, develop, which uh, take it will, uh, which uh, course it will take. Of course, uh, the whole uh, images uh, of the massacres. And if you uh, didn't uh, saw uh, them, uh, you cannot imagine uh, what uh, a um, tragedy it was. Uh, and uh, uh, to apply the numbers to the United States, uh, it uh, would be comparable to uh, 50,000 uh, uh, killed. It, uh, you must imagine the scale of the tragedy so the israeli will be less willing than before even to risk a new insecurity i cannot imagine that the israeli society even uh, the uh, left wing uh, Israelis uh, would be uh, more uh, ready uh, to make uh, any uh, concessions. It uh, was a, a traumatic experience um, what, what, what happened on the 7th of October so that the Israelis would say we could um, start a new uh, approach to two-state solutions. Uh, and, uh, Maybe we could uh, go uh, into uh, detail, maybe uh, at some point uh, the war uh, would uh, end. And so the big question is what happens after that? I know, of course, it's a very difficult question. Last days, the Israeli government um, was um, uh, didn't say uh, very much, and I agree with you that um, uh, the two states uh, solution, uh, which is uh, stressed uh, uh, out of desperation uh, because uh, it's. Uh, mentioned by the international uh, community. I don't know how many uh, settlers are in uh, the West, um, uh, John. Uh, what, what kind of a, an Israeli government uh, would be able to reverse this uh, trend? It's a big question. Uh, the only uh, solution is, uh, ex, uh, uh, is to expel them, which is not uh, uh, debatable and uh, what uh, ha what will happen to the autonomous uh, regions of uh, Palestine uh, in 
the Palestinians have no vote uh, as of time. It uh, uh, affects uh, the uh, Gaza uh, Strip uh, and uh, uh, West Bank. And uh, uh, of course, um, there must be uh, a uh, legitimate uh, Palestinian in uh, government uh, and it's a big question for uh, our politicians uh, we uh, have been talking to uh, Abbas and uh, his uh, I say it on purpose uh, corrupt surroundings because uh, everyone uh, knows uh, how uh, corrupt uh, how uh, incapable uh, this uh, government uh, uh, is uh, maybe uh, the it's um, for the go German government, uh, German politics, this uh, to state, uh, to uh, say it openly. And uh, of course, um, uh, that was uh, why he lost uh, power. And we should uh, remember that, that it was uh, an election. They uh, lost. Uh, uh, by the they lost uh, and it's unbelievable that they would like to go back to Gaza uh, and uh, uh, to expect that they will be welcomed there is um, absurd so the question is what are the structural weaknesses and um, the Israelis uh, say it's uh, Uh, not uh, our uh, task, uh, so who, uh, uh, Fatah, uh, uh, probably not, uh, maybe the United Nations, uh, but uh, here we see an absolute weakness of the United Nations. We uh, saw it in Lebanon, in other regions, and now here. So the basic question is what should uh, happen uh, uh, with uh, the United Nations and uh, uh, Germany? I was uh, uh, appalled uh, by how uh, we uh, we uh, voted uh, in this situation uh, to uh, abstain. It was uh, like uh, a slap into the face. And uh, the big question is, uh, what is the role of the European Union? You mentioned the so-called quartet uh, and uh, the United uh, the European Union. Uh, kept uh, silence for many years uh, concerning this issue and uh, because it uh, it's uh, not limited only by uh, the Middle East and the conflict in the Middle uh, East uh, it's about uh, Russia and other players and uh, it's uh, about the relations uh, to Iran uh, and by uh, the way uh, uh, the uh, treaty with uh, uh, Iran uh, was not uh, successful and uh, it was a, a um, very sobering experience uh, for all of us uh, and this decisive issue. So this big question, uh, what uh, happens uh, next or what can happen uh, next? Uh, of course, um, the goal of Israel is uh, destruction of Hamas. Is it correct? Uh, as, cons as far as uh, Gaza Strip uh, goes, uh, we have uh, three goals. Uh, we would like to regain control on uh, the border. Uh, until recently, there were attempts to infiltrate the border. Then the situation with the hostages, uh, 240 hostages, uh, children, women, uh, young uh, uh, baby, we need to liberate uh, them diplomatically or uh, militarily. And a third uh, goal, to destroy uh, Hamas, it means that uh, to, as far as possible to destroy its military infrastructure, the uh, heads of Hamas uh, and those who um, 
uh, took part in uh, the massacres of the 7th of October uh, should be uh, made responsible. These are uh, the goals of the Israeli military. It's not, they are not the political goals, but uh, the big question is once Hamas does not exist uh, anymore. There will be a power vacuum in uh, the Gaza Strip. Uh, what uh, would your army do? Uh, withdraw or what uh, happens afterwards? Basically, as a military uh, officer, I believe that uh, both uh, uh, Egypt uh, should uh, play a bigger role, maybe a moderate Israel, um, Arabic uh, countries uh, and uh, Americans and uh, Europe, in, uh, in particular uh, Germany, because uh, Germany uh, in the field of uh, uh, policy towards Israel and Palestine uh, had a significant uh, role uh, as a biggest uh, contributor of funds for uh, Palestine. And uh, we, uh, the, uh, there should be a uh, region, uh, Palestinian territory, uh, from which there is no danger for Israel uh, and with which we could live in peace. And last uh, years uh, there were uh, some uh, treaties uh, which uh, filled uh, us with uh, a hope, also uh, Israel, um, some uh, peace treaties with important uh, Arabic uh, countries. Do you think uh, there is a danger for them? I don't think so. Not because uh, there is no danger, but uh, because the negotiations, the talks with uh, Saudi Arabia uh, will uh, continue and will continue. Uh, of course, uh, they don't say that it's, uh, everything is good. They uh, are so expected to condemn, and they do it. Uh, and uh, Bahrain uh, has frozen the uh, cooperation. It was not uh, stopped, but of course it will continue. And there is a big uh, interest uh, more than before, more than before. Uh, because uh, all these uh, countries understand how dangerous Iran I is. And uh, that's why I don't uh, think uh, that we should uh, have any concerns about that. As far as the United States uh, uh, go, mm -hmm. there is a certain mixture uh, to... Uh, by the way, the... Uh, um, Palestinian uh, autonomy didn't uh, lose uh, the election in uh, Gaza Strip in that time. Uh, they were just uh, toppled by Hamas. I saw it with my own eyes. Uh, maybe uh, some uh, f uh, peace uh, troops with a robust uh, United uh, Nations uh, mandate. Uh, of course, it's just uh, my imagination. I'm just uh, trying to play it uh, through, to think it uh, through. But um, even uh, Saudi uh, Arabia could be interested uh, to uh, liberate the Palestinians from the grip uh, of uh, Iran. Uh, the situation, uh, I'm afraid, will be uh, quite chaotic. We don't know how the war will uh, develop. And the uh, um, situation in the North Lebanon is extremely volatile. And uh, even if uh, Iran and Hezbollah and Nasrallah uh, don't want uh, a war, we uh, saw what happened yesterday. Allegedly, uh, there was uh, an attack in uh, so, uh, South uh, uh, Lebanon. Uh, some people uh, were killed or injured. Uh, then there was a an attack uh, by Hezbollah, uh, and an Israeli was killed, as we heard. And but 
but uh, let us um, take a bigger geostrategic uh, picture um, so uh, the situation in uh, Gaza and uh, Hamas and uh, Russia I also hinted uh, that uh, until the 7th of October the political uh, scientists uh, uh, thought and have been talking about the so-called multipolarity uh, and uh, the federal uh, chancellor uh, said that unipolar uh, world order uh, has come to an end. They are challenged by, the, uh, by China. And uh, we uh, should uh, make uh, some considerations as to um, what kind of other actors are uh, there in the Middle East uh, and uh, The uh, regions are very different, uh, but I uh, cannot uh, imagine that Russia or uh, China uh, could uh, try uh, to play a role uh, of um, uh, peacemakers. Um, they uh, could be uh, maybe some spoilers by financial uh, support, by uh, Deal uh, weapon supplies, but as peacemakers, uh, uh, coming back to your questions, uh, to provide some plans, uh, uh, to develop some plans, to uh, offer some plans, and to implement uh, them, it's a different uh, story as the United uh, States. Um, have been supporting uh, Israel uh, and uh, the big question is uh, who is going to implement all those plans and proposals uh, uh, financially, militarily, politically and um, this, uh, this is the United uh, States uh, and um, I think concerning the Middle East, uh, we woke up in a unipolar world, but uh, Russia has uh, its uh, military uh, bases, uh, uh, of course, uh, it's uh, um, undeniable, uh, and if we uh, look uh, back uh, at what happened uh, uh, in the last uh, 10 or 15 uh, years, um, and. Uh, We uh, know that um, uh, all uh, the interrelations uh, and uh, the relations uh, uh, of Russia with the Middle East uh, uh, were underscored once again. We uh, talked about the Abraham Accord and uh, uh, we saw that it will continue uh, after a certain uh, break. Uh, the cooperation will continue. and. Uh, so, what are the German interests uh, in this region? It depends on uh, whom you talk to. The dilemma is that, uh, with the exception of uh, Sunday uh, speeches, uh, the goals are quite uh, uh, vague. Uh, for example, the foreign minister should have a clear vision, and uh, here we uh, see the start of this uh, dilemma. I am not uh, talking from the um, point of view of a uh, certain uh, party, but it's very uh, sad to see that uh, we uh, don't see uh, any uh, clarity, uh, and uh, that's why I I uh, welcome uh, the clarity uh, of uh, Mr. Habeck. Uh, I wished uh, that our Chancellor and Foreign Minister uh, would uh, speak uh, so clearly. And uh, 
uh, maybe uh, the representatives of all uh, parties and of all uh, factions in Parliament uh, should uh, uh, prepare a common um, uh, declaration uh, where uh, made uh, some payments, uh, then uh, another payment, uh, and uh, but in the long run, it uh, cannot uh, replace a politically uh, clear uh, position, stated position, and this uh, Abram uh, Accords. Uh, uh, were very uh, uh, promising uh, uh, and the uh, behavior how um, uh, Emirates uh, Egypt uh, uh, behaved it uh, fills uh, with uh, me with uh, hopes uh, but it uh, must be uh, formulated uh, clearly and uh, for this it's important to get rid of uh, illusions uh, uh, for example two state solution as a moderator, I need to look uh, at uh, the watch, uh, and uh, here I would like uh, back to a topic uh, which we must discuss. Uh, it's a humanitarian aspect of this conflict, and uh, here we uh, see a lot of suffering on both uh, sides. We cannot deny this. Uh, in your initial statement, uh, you mentioned that uh, you uh, wouldn't uh, uh, speak about uh, the civilians and their protection. And uh, here we have to pose a question. We uh, cannot verify the numbers, uh, but we can see that there are a lot of um, uh, victims, uh, you know, uh, father yourself, uh, and uh, according to the United Nations, uh, around uh, 4,000 uh, ch children. I uh, cannot uh, wake uh, up in the morning and uh, look uh, myself uh, in the mirror. Uh, and uh, Hamas uh, murdered uh, not only Israeli citizens, uh, but also uh, shot at uh, their own uh, civilians, uh, they uh, rebuilt um, civilian installations uh, into military uh, objects, uh, into military obs uh, installations. We uh, made everything uh, possible in order to warn the civilian population in the Gaza Strip. Here I would uh, show you a, a flyer. Uh, which we distribute um, via uh, drones in the northern part of the Gaza Strip in order to inform the population, please uh, go from north to the south. Uh, there is a main uh, road, Sana Heldin, a central uh, road, uh, which uh, is not uh, bombed and uh, not uh, shot at uh, by Israel and uh, thousands of civilians used uh, that uh, road and uh, uh, we um, are doing everything possible in order to protect the local uh, population. We as Israeli uh, military are responsible for protection of Israeli citizens um, and as a chosen, as elected uh, government, uh, Hamas, they should take care of um, uh, their civilian population or evacuate them, but they don't do it. But they, on the contrary, uh, they don't do it because they use, uh, they need them as a human shields between Israeli soldiers and themselves. And it's a, a military, uh, it's a war crime. And I uh, wished that uh, the international community would understand uh, that we uh, need uh, to uh, bring this uh, uh, situation uh, under control. But at the same time, uh, oh, I cannot but mention uh, the situation in uh, the refugee uh, camp uh, and uh, ambulance uh, and uh, concerning us. Uh, 
social media and in my podcast um, uh, I uh, clearly explained uh, the uh, goals of this military operation in Jabale. Uh, there was a Hamas commandant named Biari and uh, uh, dozens of other terrorists. Uh, they are all um, uh, mentioned by name uh, so that no one uh, should ask themselves uh, what are they, our goals there. Uh, the question is why do they build uh, their uh, tunnels under uh, residential uh, blocks uh, and uh, why uh, the question why this situation emerged uh, at all uh, then it's uh, a uh, Hamas is to blame for it 100 uh, percent thank you Without going much into detail, uh, you have your family in Israel uh, and uh, you all who had to suffer. Uh, so what uh, do you say about it? I know what uh, the Israelis are attempting to do. I know what uh, is the dilemma of an asymmetric warfare and uh, public discussions in the public uh, discourse. Uh, uh, abroad uh, without taking uh, sight of anyone. Uh, it's a, the uh, problem of uh, the so-called asymmetric warfare. And here the uh, war of law is applied, uh, but we know that um, one side um, does not uh, stick uh, uh, to it. And uh, so we know that one uh, party is in a very difficult situation um, because if uh, you want to fight against uh, a annoying uh, non-state uh, uh, actor and uh, it should not uh, sound uh, cynical it's an unbelievable dilemma a second dilemma is aggravating this situation the question of a ceasefire, uh, of an armistice, whatever it might be called, uh, would mean automatically a victory for Hamas. And it uh, makes the whole situation more uh, difficult from the moral point of view also, uh, because every uh, reasonable uh, a person would, uh, should say that uh, we should uh, help uh, the civilian population, but if we have this ceasefire, regardless of how much it would last, it would uh, be a big advantage for Hamas. And it's uh, something what uh, Hamas would like to provide, uh, these images, these uh, pictures, uh, so that it would provoke, um, they would uh, provoke A reaction from international uh, community. I don't um, envy the Israeli government, or Israeli uh, military, because uh, uh, this situation is extremely difficult. But uh, just uh, to make you understand the whole dilemma, what it means in such a situation if you are engaged in, a, in asymmetric warfare and concerning raison d'etat for Israel. To support uh, Ukraine means also to support Ukraine with all means possible. It's not only in the European interest uh, alone. And uh, you saw it uh, that uh, representatives of uh, Hamas uh, were in Moscow. We see a, a new access. Iranian drones are used uh, in Ukraine. We know that uh, uh, Russia would like to create a new route via. Uh, Azerbaijan and uh, further on south, a new access with uh, China. So we uh, must support Ukraine without any uh, limits. Uh, uh, thank you. And uh, uh, it uh, could be a very uh, good uh, final statement. I uh, will not uh, try uh, to uh, summarize uh, all uh, that was uh, uh, said. The situation is bitter and difficult, and uh, 
Uh, that's what we uh, heard here today. Uh, shows uh, that uh, there, are there are a lot of questions, um, and I would like uh, to uh, thank the uh, panel uh, presenters uh, and uh, Mr. Uh, Shalika uh, for your participation, and we will continue with our conference. Thank you very much. Schön, dass Sie da waren. So, herzlichen Dank.